Hi, and welcome back to Psychology with me, Mr. Snyder. And today we are going to discuss something that is very, very important to psychology and something that we've uh, referenced since we have been talking about psychology, and that is statistics. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Learning targets today, we're going to talk about descriptive versus inferential statistics. We'll talk about graphical representations of data. We'll talk once again about correlation or coefficients. Uh, then we'll touch on inferential statistics, reliability versus validity, and qualitative versus quantitative forms of data. So let's go get started. Uh, statistics is a branch of mathematics that is concerned with collecting and interpreting numerical data. Psychologists use it because it helps them summarize the information from a study or experiment and to analyze and make decisions about the data. Uh, so we use descriptive statistics to organize numbers and see patterns and identify patterns. And then the other one is inferential statistics, and that helps us with psychologists' second goal to um, determine if the differences in the data set are greater than chance variation would predict, and we'll get into that in just a second. But first, descriptive statistics. It, again, it's a way of organizing numbers and summarizing them so that patterns can be determined. There's two main types, and you're probably familiar with most of them. So this is review. Measures of central tendency give us one score that seems pretty typical of your sample. And the measures of variability, which talks about the range of data. Uh, the three measures of central tendency that are used are the mean, median, and mode. I hope you know fourth grade mathematics, but the mean is the most commonly used and it's uh, the average. The fallback on it is that it doesn't work for extreme scores, and I'll tell you why here in a second. I'll show you an example. The median is the one that falls in the middle of an order distribution of scores, and it's the average of the two middle scores if it's the number is even. And the mode is the most frequent score. And measures of variability or seeing the range of scores the other end of descriptive statistics is to use um, how spread out they are and uh, the more that the scores cluster around the central scores the smaller the measure of variability will be and there's two ways to do this the range which is the difference between the highest and the lowest scores in the distribution and standard deviation we're not going to talk about how to calculate standard deviation because that can be kind of uh, confusing but it's the statistical measure of the average deviation from the mean score. So it talks about the amount of variation in a set of data. And I'll give you an example here in a second. But for this, if we have these 10 scores, which show an intelligence test scores for 10 people, here you can see we have one outlier. Allison scored a 240 IQ, which is ridiculously smart. But uh, that adjusts the average up for, by a lot. So the, meeting, the mean is now 114.6 for these uh, 10 sets of data, whereas the median is the average of 102 and 100, so 101. And the mode, three people got scores of 100, so that would be the mode score. So again, the mean throws off the central tendency of this data set, but the median and mode are pretty much spot on. How do we represent this data in graphics? Well, uh, there are different charts that are used for different purposes, charts, graphs, whatever. Frequency distributions, you can see here, uh, the frequency distribution is in table 3.2 here. And there's also this on a um, frequency graph right there. And then we can also talk about the normal curve or the bell curve, which is in the uh, bottom. So frequency distributions, we can talk about um, it's a set of data, a table, or a graph that shows how often different numbers appear in particular sets of scores. And you can do this by using a histogram or a bar graph and a polygon. And here's the polygon and the histogram for this uh, certain set of data that we saw in 3.2, I believe, the glass of water per day. And then the normal curve or the bell curve allows us to see the shape of a set of data. Um, they, the scores decrease as the curve extends from the mean. This can model things like intelligence, height, or weight in a large perspective. And we use it because it has very specific relationships to measures of central tendency, and this is how we can see standard deviation. And a, if this is done right on the right set of data, it is shaped like a bell. That's why it's also called a bell curve. 
Uh, sometimes this can be skewed, and we can have skewed distributions of data, which means that they're not equal on both sides of a central score with the highest frequency. And so here you can see the scores. Here's an example of a normal bell curve in the middle with no skew. Uh, negatively skewed, which means that um, the data is in a negative direction. The concentration of scores are in the high end of the distribution. Here you can see mean, median, and motor kind of stretched out. And then if it's the other way and you have a concentration of scores in the low end of the distribution, that means that it is a positive skewed data set. And here's uh, another picture of a frequency polygon that I believe I forgot to take out. Finding relationships, uh, your learning objective or target 3.3. And we've already kind of talked about correlation, but it's the measure of two or more variables uh, in a data set. So we use a formula, and we're not going to go into this in this class, but we use a formula to determine what the correlational coefficient is. And that measures the strength and the direction of the relationship between the two variables. A positive correlational coefficient is when the variables move in the same direction. So as one increases, the other increases. As one decreases, the other decreases. It's a positive uh, relationship between the data. Uh, the more time, the more miles per day you run, the healthier you are. Those two things are related. Negative correlational coefficient is a negative relationship. So as one increases, the other decreases. The more cigarettes you smoke per day, the less healthier you are. That would be a negative correlational coefficient. Now let's get to our next set or section, which is inferential statistics. And this is how we um, take analysis of two or more sets of numerical data to determine how it could have been an error in measurement and we also talk about if the differences in the data sets are greater than just chance, chance variation to predict. And we need to look for differences in group measurements that are statistically significant. If this sounds like Spanish to you, don't worry. If you know Spanish and it sounds like some other language, don't worry. So all our inferential statistics look for differences in group measurements. And we look for this statistical significance. And what that is, is it's a way to test differences in data to see how likely those differences are to be real and not just caused by random variations in behavior that exist in everything animals and people do. So this helps researchers discover whether effects are caused by the experiment or by chance. And again, we're not going to go into how we met or how we find these measurements, but you just need to know what these measurements are. And so the researchers are satisfied in experiments when there's a 95% likelihood that their experimental results did not occur by chance. So in scientific journals or research papers or uh, stuff we may get into or read, the significance is represented by the equation P is less than 0 0.05, meaning that the probability that the results of the experiment uh, have occurred by chance is less than 5 out of 100, 5%. Thus, the results are statistically significant. And here you go, a picture of Ryan Gosling uh, saying, hey, girl, you must be P greater than 0 0.05 because I failed to reject you. So research results should be valid and reliable. Uh, re the reliability of a study or data or whatever Ten is the tendency of a test to produce the same scores again and again if it's given to the same people. And validity is whether the test actually measures what it is supposed to measure. So think the example I always use with these two things, and I'll use it in class too, I'm sure, is scale. A scale is a test of your weight. The reliability of the scale is if you step on the scale three times, you're going to get the same weight. And validity is whether that is actually your weight or not. So if Mr. Snyder steps on a scale and it says 175 three times, then that is a reliable test. But is it a valid test? No, I'm actually more like 200. So it's not going to tell my actual weight, but it is a reliable test because it gave me the uh, same weight three times. It's one of a... Psychologists' most important and helpful tools is statistical analysis. Now let's get into the, just think of it this way. Everything we've talked about in the last 10 minutes is quantitative data or quantity, numbers. It's how we measure things in numbers. 
qualitative data is more subjective in nature because it's non-numerical. It's more words and it more offers a more holistic view of study, uh, the subject being studied. So these may try to identify themes or factors in an experiment that numbers uh, can't be used to paint. This is more of uh, survey results with um, open-ended answers and it's used to maybe prompt ideas for experiments. Uh, you can do these by interviews, self-reports by participants, responses to open-ended questions on a survey, like I already mentioned, uh, source material like journals or diaries, or anecdotes, which are short stories about stuff. So qualitative data is non-numerical data. Quantitative or quantity, quantitative data is numerical data. That's all I have for you on statistics. Keep filling out those learning targets, and I will talk to you.